Hello, Dr. Rika Solimosis, and thanks for accepting my invitation for this chat for the Reproducer Research Scout YouTube channel. Let's start with your introduction. Okay. Hi. Hi, Rania. It's good, good to see you. Uh, yeah, as you said, my name is Rika. I am a, a senior lecturer at University of Manchester. Um, I'm based in School of Social Sciences in the Department of Criminology, uh, but my title is actually Lecturer in Quantitative Methods because uh, I do the data things. Um, yeah, so I work on all topics related to, well, not all, but many topics related to, to crime, uh, security, fear of crime, a little bit of policing, and I work with all sorts of data, but I prefer doing spatial analysis, so uh, data that has a particular location uh, attached, and looking at patterns and trends in crimes and perceptions and policing. So you are Sherlock Holmes, right? <laughs> I uh <laughs> wait it depends which version the original novel version the um what's his name Benedict Cumberbatch version <laughs> um Sherlock Holmes with data maybe yeah that sounds too cool for me <laughs> pretty sure that's not so how do you define reproducible research and why it's important for you uh so to me reproducible research uh, means a set of practices which ensure that any uh, sort of data analysis and any research um, and therefore any sort of recommendations that come out of my research are uh, transparent and traceable and, and reproducible. So I know I don't use the word in the definition. Uh, but I guess just means that if I put something out there and say, you know, in order to uh, better uh, ensure that missing person uh, call for appeals get seen by the public, you should put pictures of a person you know, smiling instead of a custody photo, right? So if I make that kind of recommendation or something like that, it's important that somebody coming to look at that can go through my process, see how I got there and ensure that um, when I, I'm not just pulling these recommendations uh, out of the air and that they're actually evidence-based. So that's, I think, especially important uh, for me in my work because it's uh, quite applied what I do. So often there are direct recommendations like this coming out of uh, my research. And so I want uh, anyone coming across that research and thinking about implementing it to be able to trust and audit the, the process by which uh, I got there. And I think criminology specifically has had a bit of a bad rep in uh, the, well, it started, I think, in the pre-pandemic pre years um, of having uh, some issues around people making the data do things that the data maybe shouldn't have been doing. And, uh, and there was a bit of a scandal getting, um, trying to get these papers redacted. Uh, so it all came out into the open around 2019. Uh, so... I think in light of that, it's very important that criminology, you know, who inform criminal justice policy, which has very real impact on people's lives, has a, has that auditable, transparent and reproducible process in place. That's very cool. Um, anything that guides uh, political uh, decisions is very important to be reproducible. Uh, but reproducibility is usually at the end of the research uh, chain. So let's talk a little bit of the beginning. Uh, what is pre-registration? I saw a tweet that I put a link somewhere. Uh, you was mentioned pre-registration. Can you explain to us? Uh, yes, I can try. So the, uh, in theory, the idea behind the pre-registration is that when you are going to carry out a piece of research, uh, to do some hypothesis testing, you, uh, before collecting any data or anything like that, uh, put that out into the public to say what you're testing, what is the hypothesis that you want to test, what is the data that you're going to collect, and what will be the process to analyze that data in order to be able to test that hypothesis and answer your research questions. And the uh, idea behind that is Th that by putting things out there in the first place before even collecting your data, 
you uh, you know expose yourself and say this is what I'm going to test this is the data that I'm going to collect and then if you collect the data and it you know doesn't quite get you the answers that you were interested in you know um, then you cannot look to uh, change anything so do a sneaky subgroup analysis where you know you subgroup subgroup oh this result is significant so this is what I was trying to do all along um, it's a kind of guidance in place to prevent anything like that because you know speaking a bit uh, about it like this, it sounds like it's intentionally malicious that people are going, oh, I'm going to find the result and I'm just going to get that publication. But I think as a, you know, academics under a lot of pressure to publish and to publish in the UK, we have the ref of the, uh, you know, all of your publications need to be graded on the star system where four star means that you literally changed the world in the field and you got to do that once a year. So under that pressure, I think it's very easy for people to even who wouldn't think that they'd be disposed to fishing out the nice results uh, to, to do that. But with pre-registration, you've kind of put that guard up in place to prevent yourself uh, from doing that. So that's a pre-registration in theory. And in my experience, the reason I put out that tweet is because I went, okay, I'm going to run an experiment. I'm about to start data collection. Let's do the pre-registration. And I went on OSF to do it, the open science framework. And there's a million templates that you could choose. I picked one and it had so many questions. I was like, okay, this is Ooh, this is gonna take me like two weeks to do the pre-registration. Uh, and then I searched around a little bit like, which template should I pick for social science? And then I found which one to, or one that was recommended by the internet. I picked that one and that one was just like, what is your uh, research question? How are you gonna answer it? Have you started collecting data yet? And like those three questions take done, pre-registration complete. So. I don't, I don't know if I did this right. This is a bit too easy. Um, <laughs> That's a, a practice that should be implemented or like become more common uh, among all researchers. I think is really important. I don't remember where I see, probably it was Twitter. Uh, someone was mentioned uh, a pre-registration portal that's connected with like a academic journal where they kind of like guarantee that your paper will be published if you had a pre-registration, which means that even if you don't get that f incredible finding to change the world, you will still have some publications to go on your CV and so on. So I will try to search it and don't recollect where it was. Mm. But yeah, that was good. And uh, what tools do you use for make your research reproducible? Uh, you had mentioned the pre-registration, so from getting the data, collecting the data and analyzing the data, what have you been using? Yeah, um, I think tools that, uh, I, I'm quite lucky that I'm comfortable with using tools that lend themselves very nicely to the open science and open research movement. Um, so for the data analysis, for example, I use code-based uh, research. So I've got my uh, I heart a tidyverse cup that I got from a from a student uh, on a summer school course uh, where I was teaching uh, R. So I use R a lot, and because it's code-based, you know, I can publish all the code on GitHub, and uh, and it's nice and, and transparent, and people can see what I did. Uh, and you know if, if, if I did something wrong, what I did wrong and, and so on. So I use R, I use GitHub. Um, and then I mentioned the open science uh, framework. So I usually create a page for each project. Um, I store data there. I link to my GitHub for the code there. I've now done that pre-registration uh, in there through there as well through OSF. Uh, and I and then when it gets to, uh, the end of the project. So if it's data that I can uh, publish or release, I'll put it up there. I know some colleagues mentioned that actually the university supports us putting data on Figshare um, is another platform. So I haven't used it yet, but um, I have, yeah, if you have nice big data sets to release, uh, that's an option. And then um, at the end, when I write up the paper, I put it on archive. So for us, that's a SOCH archive. And then also there's no CRIM archive um, so that the preprint of the paper is available to read. And I've got a personal blog 
So I'll write a little blog post about the paper, just highlighting some key findings and then link to all of these and put that on uh, Twitter. You mentioned two uh, pre uh, preprint servers. How do you decide where to submit your preprint? <laughs> yeah, that's a <laughs> roll the dice. <laughs> um, I've been uh, using Social Archive uh, just because I think that's where people you know, would, my, people, uh, would, would be would be reading and searching. And then Crim Archive, I think, is more new. Um, so it's now we are putting all of our things, uh, all our, our preprints uh, up there uh, as it's meant to be more for a criminology audience, both to collect everything, but also to encourage people to, to publish their preprints there. Do you know any easy way to move data from uh, the open science framework to Figshare or you didn't export this yet? I have not explored this no i've been relatively uh i don't know slack about my uh, my my open data pipe once it's out there i just let it live its life until uh, until somebody contacts me about it and says you know i can't reach this or or i don't know this is you know this code didn't make sense can you elaborate on it um, and then I go back and I go, okay, yeah, we should do this. But I, uh, so far, I've kind of once it's out there on any platform, I'm just going, mm, yeah, it's out there. Uh, but it might, yeah, maybe right, maybe we should do a cleanup and, and harmonize where things are stored. Because uh, I know the Open Science Framework for a couple of years, but I never managed to get my head around how to use it. <laughs> it's so frustrating to say. That. <laughs> uh, like, yeah again huge disclaimer i don't know if i'm using it right i'm just using it <laughs> so far i've gotten people uh who reach out to me who have used my code um so i feel like it, something is going right but maybe yeah maybe i'm not optimally using it either so that's a disclaimer uh, so Thank, uh, so how is your experience of sharing the tools and practice that enable you to make your research reproducible with your peers? Uh, yeah, I mean, so I am uh, sort of advocate for, for use of R or, you know, other script based uh, analytical approach and I uh, try and advocate for people to you know, publish their uh, preprints and share data where possible um, and that sort of thing. I've had some really nice experiences of people reaching out to me who have used the uh, things that I've put out there. Um, I know it's always it's such a nice feeling. I got, you know, get an email from a colleague in New Zealand who's like, oh, I'm so happy that you've openly released your teaching materials because I'm building a class and like leaning on it so much. Like, oh, that's good. Or um, also we get a lot of practitioners, so crime analysts uh, reaching out who have used something that I've put out there, um, not necessarily in terms of, oh, I want to replicate the findings of this paper, but instead, oh, I want to use this technique and apply it in my day-to-day -day work. Um, so I've had quite a few from different departments, some of them being like, I'm sorry, I can't tell you what I'm working on because it's classified. <laughs> but if you used your code and it's really helpful, okay. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> uh, so those experiences are really nice. And I try and highlight those when speaking with colleagues to be like, you should really do these things. Um, but I'm, yeah, I don't know if I'm advocate enough. Uh, we've had recently a presentation in our research day by one of my colleagues who was uh, saying, you know, here's the reasons why you should uh, do open research. And he was very good, very systematic about presenting, like, these are the things that you can do, these are the benefits. Um, and then some of the comments from colleagues you know, were uh, voicing some things that are you know, very well known in, in, you know, open science communities of, oh, but somebody will come in and scoop my idea, or they will scoop my data, or, you know, these things that um, I know that have been uh discussed as barriers 
Uh, so I wonder if I should be more active of looking at, okay, well, what can be done to, to tackle these barriers? Um, yeah, any advice always helpful. <laughs> um, I know that people are scared of being stupid and having one of things that people have been raising over and over. So one of the main things is like pre-registrations. Uh, once you do your pre-registrations, it becomes kind of like harder to be stupid. Or I mean, someone might be able to scoop you, or, but there's a pre-registration saying that's your original idea. Uh, so I think it's still like lots of practice on the academia is still new, even if they are for people that have been practicing, like, as I say, like reproducibility and prayer registrations, they're not one year old. So they are like kind of three, five, 10 years old already. But for the whole academic uh, group, it's still kind of like new. Uh, yeah, but, absolutely. And oh, uh, I think for uh, for us in at least in criminology I think it's still quite new and I think a lot of people are are worried and I'm in you know I'm in a privileged position in that I have a permanent post uh, I have a you know very kind uh, head of department so I am in a position where I can try to do pre-registration I can try to put my data and if I'm not doing something completely right I can learn from that mistake and you know, not lose my my job yeah. over it uh, so so I, I recognize that it's, for me, I think, uh, quite easy to go, you know, I don't fully understand OSF, but let me try and use it anyway. Um, so I think having that uh, confident or like space to, to make these mistakes, because like you said, in other area, uh, other domains, other disciplines, it's been years and years and years and people have a system and it's in place, whereas in some others, like in our uh, area, everyone's still kind of well, I don't want to say everyone. I know that there's some groups that are very on top of, of uh, pre-registrations and open science. Um, so I think, but that, because there's that uh, imbalance, and it might be a bit of a, again, like you said, that that bear, that little bit of a fear of, um, ooh, I think, you know, maybe not even from the scooping, but oh, I'm going to be found out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe learning from people who are already quite advanced on the reproducibility journey could be one approach. Uh, talking about jobs and so on, did you get any award or fellowship related with research reproducibility or software that had you been putting on the internet? Uh, indeed, yes. I am uh, a, a fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute. Um, so that was uh, in ooh, 2017. 18 <laughs> long time yeah, bc so bc everything <laughs> um yeah so that was a really really fantastic opportunity for me to learn a lot more about reproducibility open source software software sustainability research software um it opened up a whole new world to me and i know since my fellowship there's been more and more social science and i think before there was a couple as well more and more social science fellows and that's really 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 nice to see that level of engagement and yeah just getting support from that community is changed the my uh, outlook on research and everything it's really supportive so yeah thank you for reminding me of that that was a uh, very important on my reproducibility <laughs> journey that's good uh we running out of time there is any project that you want to share before we finish uh well the one that i <laughs> pre-registered pre uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, without saying too much because I don't want to uh, uh, give you know if any future participants are, are watching this uh, we're looking at different types of bystander interventions uh, in cases of sexual harassment and whether some interventions have different effects on the situation than others so that's a sort of experimental research which I haven't done in a long time since my master's uh, so I'm, I'm very looking forward to that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rika, for your time and this joyful conversation. I hope that you have a good day and enjoy the summer there in the UK. <laughs> Thanks so, so much, Renier. <laughs>